Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to um, our conversation today on Somalia's elections in 2020, 2021, uh, lowering the prospects of turmoil. Um, my name is Alyssa Jobson. I'm Global Director for Advocacy at International Crisis Group, and I'm going to be moderating the session today. I, um, I think you'll agree that with Somalia's elections fast, fast approaching, that our conversation today is, is, is really timely. Um, we've got three really um, interesting speakers today. Uh, Omar Mahmoud is the senior analyst um, of Somalia, on Somalia at the International Crisis Group. We also have with us Michael Keating, who's the executive director of the European Institute of Peace and, and the UN Secretary General's uh, former UN, former um, UN special, repre special representative to Somalia. We also have Hodan Hassan, who is the executive director with Kulan Consulting, and she's got more than 13 years of um, working experience in the region and nine years of that on, on, the, um, on Somalia. So, I mean, today um, the session's going to sort of fall into two parts. First of all, there'll be a, a QA with, with me and, and our speakers. Followed by that, um, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Um, we're looking for a really lively conversation today. So if you do have questions, please do use the chat function, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. Uh, sorry, not the chat function, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen um, to, to, to put in your questions. If you want to, if you want to ask a question, um, we'll, then, we'll then read out the, we'll read it out. If you could, include your name and your affiliation when you put in your questions, that would be great. I'll give you a, a reminder of this, first of all, uh, well, um, as, as we go along. First of all, um, I'd, I'd like to sort of ask uh, Omar a couple of questions really to sort of set the scene. I mean, it'd be really good, uh, Omar, if you could outline for us the broad political and security context in which the upcoming elections are taking place. Thanks, Omar. Sure, thanks, Alyssa. Um, so Somalia is headed into election season that's constitutionally mandated to occur by December of this year for parliament and February of 2021 for the presidency. Now, of course, security is still quite fragile in Somalia as militant groups like Al-Shabaab remain a potent force and the country remains dependent on external security actors uh, to enforce security as well. But politically, Somalia is also quite divided and making the environment around these elections perhaps as contested as any in recent memory. And I think this was highlighted throughout 2020, where Somalia's main political stakeholders argued quite a bit over just what kind of electoral model they were even gonna implement as there wasn't basic agreement on that point. Uh, the current push for a one person, one vote plan, which was scheduled in 2016, but kicked down to the road due to a number of issues. But the opposition felt the conditions weren't really ripe uh, this time around either for such a process, nor could it really be conducted in, in a timely manner, given some delayed preparations. And, and so rather, we, we had a really torturous series of discussions between the government and the member states until in September, they agreed to conduct another indirect election. So very similar to how we saw the elections in 2016-17. And so that was a very positive step as a consensus on a path forward, but it took up so much time and capital that it put a lot of pressure, I think, on conducting these elections in, in a bit of a rushed timeline. The other issue is, is for those who are not familiar with what these indirect elections mean, uh, basically it's a model where clan representatives select electoral colleges for each uh, seat of lower house of parliament. And those electoral colleges in turn choose the representatives. The, the upper house of parliament is still chosen by the federal member states themselves and both combine to select the presidency. But one of the issues was in, in 2016-17, we saw much corruption and manipulation embedded in the electoral process. And so this return to an indirect model while the census path forward within Somalia given an inability to come to other sorts of uh, outcomes is, is still disappointing for many. And so there've been some changes that have been enacted to demonstrate some progress, especially under inclusivity and, and transparency. Um, chief among these, uh, just I'll list quickly, are the electoral college's sizes are expanding from 51 
per electoral college to 101. So they're basically doubling, which means about 27,000 people will participate in the election this time around. Also, the geographic range of voting has expanded. A second location for each member state has been added. So now we have 11 vo different voting centers. And also, which, which is not quite fully clear, but civil society has been given a bit of a role in the selection process for the electoral colleges as well. And this is aimed at reducing the dominance of clan elders. So, so we have this consensus model and, and a bit of an expansion of the 2016 process. But again, it is slight and it's debatable in this rushed environment to what degree those will result in, in electoral improvements. And, and I think a key example of that is today is December 1st is the day that the election for the upper house senators was supposed to commence, but we still don't even have finalization on some of the electoral committees. So, so it, we're very much on schedule and, and a lot of this process demonstrates just how little trust there's been between the main stakeholders to this point. Thanks, Omar. I mean, you said that um, you know, these are going to be some of the most, con the most contentious elections that, the, that Somalia is facing. And I was just wondering if you could drill down a, a little bit further into the political Political disputes that are currently holding up an agreement on the electoral process and maybe go into detail a little bit on some of the technical steps that are needed. Thanks. Uh, definitely. So there's a number of issues at the political level, despite this September consensus that we saw, uh, which have not been resolved and really threaten the ability of the process to move forward. And, and unfortunately, these largely relate to attempts by various actors to influence or manipulate the electoral process, especially given that it is, again, an indirect election. Now, that's really nothing new in the, in the Somali context, but highlights a recurrent challenge that those who are designing and implementing the rules of the game are really at the same time the main competitors to it. At any rate, the opposition to Farmaggio, which at this point consists of presidential candidates, some member states like, like Puntland and Jubaland, and, and even some sections of, of parliament, such as the upper house speaker, uh, they've complained about a number of issues. I think there's three important ones that need to be resolved. Uh, first is the composition of the uh, electoral committees at both the federal and state level. There have been a lot of complaints that the nominees to these aren't really uh, impartial figures, but rather include active security personnel and, and civil servants. And, you know, I think the key point here is that this covers nominations from both uh, the federal government, but also some of the member states and ties into this idea of having a royal committee will allow for influence in the proceeding one way or the other. So this has been a key sticking point for the political opposition at this point is actually called for these committees to be disbanded and new committees to be formed. Uh, secondly, we've seen an ongoing contestation in the ghetto region of Jubaland over the past year. Uh, that's been a manifestation of center periphery tensions in Somalia that have worsened in recent years, uh, but it remains a pressing issue. And it's, it's not just for Jubaland, but others in the opposition have taken up this issue as well. And so it's become a national issue affecting the election process. Basically right now, uh, Jubilant leader Ahmed Badobe uh, refuses to allow the election to be held in ghetto as long as federal troops are on the ground. It was uh, rumors of an agreement between him and Farmaggio, uh, but really the, the reality is the situation in ghetto hasn't, hasn't changed. And at stake is 16 of Jubilant's 43 seats for the lower house are scheduled to happen in Ghetto's capital of Garbahar. And so it's a bit of a tussling over, over that um, control as well. Uh, the third big dispute on the horizon is who has the right to nominate Somaliland's electoral committee members. Now, of course, since Somaliland doesn't participate in this process, it complicates who has this say. And then the federal government is arguing right now with the upper house speaker who is originally from Somaliland on this point, and in both of them have nominated their own committees. And so it's another important dynamic that relates to control or influence of the process. At stake, Somaliland has 46 seats in the lower house and 11 seats in the upper house, so a sizable block uh, of that. And in, in really another issue that demands resolution, because otherwise you face the prospect of two distinct committees arguing that they have legitimacy over the other. So these, these political disputes are a byproduct of heightened distrust and must be resolved immediately as with each passing day 
the possibility of conducting the elections in line with the mandated timelines becomes uh, an ever increased challenge. But at the same time, I think they overshadow some of the necessary work on the technical side that could be used rather to improve the accountability and transparency of the elections. And in a few important aspects, you know, one is the uh, one I mentioned at the outset of this is upholding civil society's role in the delegate selection process. Now, this hasn't been clearly laid out, especially as the electoral committee haven't been finalized either. But if civil society has a role here that can provide a check on what we've seen in the past two elections, which was really the dominance of clan elders in this step. Another aspect is, is enhancing dispute resolution mechanisms. In 2016-17, this didn't really have a strong track record as some recommendations weren't really implemented. Uh, but without this, that means electoral grievances aren't addressed and rather elect to linger. Uh, that can lead to violence down the road or even groups like Al-Shabaab, the ability to exploit these dynamics. And, and of course, another one is ensuring that the 30% women's quota in parliament is met. Uh, there was a lot of effort around this in 2016, and, and the uh, share of, of women in parliament basically doubled. Uh, but there hasn't been as much collaboration on this point uh, in this election to date and how you would go from that 24 to 30 percent threshold. Uh, so unfortunately, I think we have a layer of political disputes that are blocking progress on a technical level and causing rushed timelines that overshadow the process of implementing improvements within the electoral model. Uh, but worryingly, however, is that without any resolution on the political side, Somalia is headed to an uncertain period where miscalculation or unilateral maneuvers could result in violence. And I think that underscores the urgent need, uh, this heightened distrust in, in this environment, the urgent need for dialogue and compromise on all sides. Thanks, Omar. I, mean, I think it would be interesting now to sort of hear from, from, from you, Michael, about um, to sort of put this in perspective of what, what was happening in the previous electoral, electoral cycle. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the main challenges that you faced as SRSG during the run-up to the 2016 elections. Well, thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to join you in this. Uh, the other day, I listened to my successors, Jim Swan, uh, address to the Security Council, um, something I had to do every three months. And I was struck by how very similar uh, his address was today, as mine was exactly four years ago, at roughly the same time. Uh, in the process. Um, you know, uh, all the issues about the need to respect the timetable, uh, concerns about the relationship between the federal member uh, states and the federal government, uh, concerns about security, uh, and so on. So in many ways, really not much has changed since 2016, 2017 in terms of the electoral model and many of the politics, much of the politics around it, as we are facing in 2020, 2021. And I'm not sure if I made myself that popular, but my last address to the Security Council after three years, I pointed out that on my way to the airport, uh, I was still receiving calls from people in the federal member states complaining about the federal government and people in the federal government complaining about the federal member states. And that's what happened the day I arrived uh, in Somalia three years earlier. So we have some fairly fundamental features of Somali politics that tend to, to, to frame uh, what's going on. But I think what I would point out is we're operating in a very different uh, international environment. Um, you know, not only in terms of the US administration, when I joined, there was Obama. Uh, and then, of course, uh, President Trump took over. Um, and I think we've seen a resurgence of geopolitical competition, particularly among regional actors. You've had issues among Gulf states, which have played out in Somalia. Uh, and more recently, um, uh, I think uh, you've also had, I think, a degradation of support for the multilateral system, which has affected the role of the UN and the role that the UN can play uh, in elections uh, and in other aspects of politics in places like Somalia. 
Um, and moreover, you've got um, uh, what's happening in the immediate region, uh, particularly uh, in Ethiopia over uh, Tigray. So you've got a very, very difficult um, uh, uh, environment in which these things are now playing out. Uh, I, I would say the biggest single political event over the last month has been the US elections. And one of the observations, I, I was deeply impressed staying up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, watching everybody doing the counting and learning from CNN and MNSBC, and then subsequently learning more about the system from all the, you know, the legal challenges. I've been deeply impressed by how much, uh, you know, how much substructure there is to US elections in terms of the organization, the money, the rules, the observers. And yet the outcome, is, the legitimacy of the outcome is disputed by many in the Republican Party. And I would argue this is precisely the opposite of the situation you have in Somalia, where you actually have an election which is by many yardsticks pretty, um, you know, um, partly because of lack of resources, but there isn't really a very su strong substructure to them. But in 2016, 27, the results were greeted as legitimate by everybody instantly whether it was by the Somalis, whether it was by the neighbors, whether it's by the international community, even though there had been issues around, you know, corruption and, and manipulation and media and bad behavior and, and all the rest of it. So you have the kind of polar opposite in a way uh, of, the, of the American uh, scenario. So, um, and, it, and actually I remember being at the inauguration of President Farmaggio and, President Kenyatta saying in his 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 well his congratulatory speech, we wish we had elections that were as well run uh, in Kenya as you have just had in Somalia, which was maybe he was being diplomatic, but it does make the point. You look at what's happened in Tanzania, you look at what happened in Uganda, what's happening in Kenya, you know the problems in Ethiopia have been partly around electoral politics and all the rest of it, and I think the main point I would make is that, you know, you've got to figure out what are elections for in a place like Somalia. This is the question I was constantly asking myself. And I think it's legit, uh, it, 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 it's the right question to ask now. And these, you know, these elections are not taking place in some sort of vacuum. They're taking place in a country which has been through a terrible civil war, which continues to face conflict at the very local level between the federal government and the federal member states. You've got issues around Somaliland. You know, the Somali space is contested by international partners. You've got weak state structures. You've got lack of consensus as to what the state should look like, what federalism should look like. And, and therefore you've got to figure out, well, what kind of political process is gonna deliver a legitimate transfer of power that is acceptable to all Somalis? And what is actually doable? And so while I recognize that there are many shortcomings and Omar has, has, has set them out with this process and there certainly were in 2016, 2017, you do have to ask the question, what would the alternative be? It would be extremely difficult to have one person, one vote elections. It would be extremely difficult to organize things in a way that doesn't ratchet up this insecurity, the sense of trust and all the rest of it. And I would argue that actually the elections in Somalia are a terrific display of how Somali politics work. Every detail of these elections is politically uh, disputed and contested, whether it's you know, the numbers in the electoral college, whether it's the who's providing the security, whether it's who's in charge of the voting booths, everything is subject to a, 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 a political, um, you know, um, uh, uh, to, to Somali politics. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I would argue in a, in a country that is still, you know, has the clan based system, the 4.5 formula, that is still uh, in which, you know, an insurgency controls very large parts of the country, which doesn't have the resources to, you know, put up a, a, a proper electoral system. You know, even though I am the first, having watched it very close up to recognize the deficiencies in the system. I think we should be careful about advocating for a model which actually could be uh, much, much more complicated in terms of what Somalia needs 
uh, right now in terms of its uh, current trajectory. So, of course, uh, I have so much more to say, but maybe I should stop here and look forward to, to the questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank, um, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Michael. And I think, you know, this, the, you know, the comparison that you made to the, um, to the, to the US elections is, is an interesting one. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we've, many of us who've been sort of watching Somalia have seen, you know, the, 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 the pressure for one, one, one person, one vote has, has largely come from, from the international community, or at least there's been a strong pressure from that. And that's something that has, the, the international community has definitely been cha uh, chasing. Anyway, I wanted to, to turn to Hodan now and, um, you know, talk to her a little bit about this, uh, about the process um, and why we haven't, you know, made more progress between the two elections as, as, as many would have liked to have seen to a, to a more, um, uh, a, um, a more representative um, electoral process, if not necessarily one person, one vote. Thanks, Hadan. Mm. Uh, thank you. And uh, first, I just want to thank ICG for, for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, greetings to Omar and to, and to Michael Keating. Um, <clears throat> I really think the answer to that question is, is basically everything you've just heard uh, in terms of uh, the fact that uh, the issues that have challenged, you know, both the international community and the Somali's ability to develop electoral, sound electoral pro processes is ultimately around politics and less around technical issues. So I think it helps to understand what is actually happening in the country contextually um, during these two sets of periods. So I'll just look at 20, so just a little bit about, I, I was working for USAID <clears throat> uh, from 2008 to 2016, so participated um, and focused a lot on the 2012 transition as well as the 2016 to some degree, and then the Somaliland elections. So, you know, from that vantage point, <clears throat> I. I can I share Michael's uh, frustration sometimes and challenges around trying to get a technical process forward in, with, with a lot of the political challenges that exist. But if you were to look at the 2012-2016 process, um, as soon as um, President Hassan Sheikh was inaugurated, uh, <clears throat> there, first of all, like in any situation, a lot of the attention moved away from how do we start to plan a <clears throat> start now to plan an electoral cycle so that we can at least move halfway towards a one person, one vote to a multitude of other challenges and issues and priorities. And at that time, if you can remember, it was a federal state without federal units with the exception of Puntland. So there was the whole process of having these federal member states come into existence, which can only be described as ad hoc messy affairs um, that were primary elite bargains with little or no popular participation. Um, but nevertheless, they emerged. Um, and in that environment, starting to plan an electoral process um, is not actually feasible uh, because the key stakeholders who are going to be partners in deciding and moving this forward are not at the table. So even President Hassan Sheikh noted this. So by, by July, 2015, uh, it was a, the, the government admitted that there was no possibility for a one person, one vote um, and started, and that allowed for the emergence of a consensus model um, with the other FMS um, um, uh, leadership um, that, that was able to expand the electorate from the 2012 process, which was strictly about, I can't remember the number, but I wanna say something like about 150 elders selecting the parliamentarians who then selected the president to one that actually had electoral colleges uh, colleges, electoral, electri um, electoral colleges to some degree in the federal member state. So that was an improvement. And as was noted, you also had the, uh, uh, the ability to have a, a female uh, a quota of about 30%. So yes, you know, improvements. And, 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 and as, as, as Mr. Keating highlighted, there was a lot of positive um, feeling in, I was in Mogadishu, you know, about a month after he was, he was um, elected. And you can say that there was generally a positive and optimistic uh, sense. Now let's talk about 2016 to 2020. Um, there, the political contestation, as was highlighted by by Omar, has continued, and instead of it being focused on the emergence of federal member states, 
what you had was multiple elections that took place at the federal member states. Again, messy affairs, contestation between within these federal member states, as well as between the federal government and federal member states, accusations of interference and accusations of different visions of what federalism look like. Um, so in that, in, that, in that environment, again, those of us who, although I'm not focused on it now, but those who are focused on moving the technical process forward have been most spending most of their time trying to be on the sidelines while there was a political a political um, agreement made by the key stakeholders. Um, and the other issues, I mean, we have to remember that the same group of people who are focusing on trying to get the electoral process forward are the same folks, both on the government side and the international side, that are focusing on multitude of other priorities, security sector, combating al-Shabaab, uh, the fragile humanitarian situation, you know, droughts, floods, locusts, um, and then all of the other development priorities, right? So the, the bandwidth within both the Somali political leadership and the international community is already relatively stretched. Uh, so it's much easier to kind of keep kicking the can down the road. Um, and then on the technical process, right, because of the last minute nature of these political agreements, uh, and, and this has been consistent, you know, the formation of a new Somali government really has been guided by extra constitutional agreements on an ad hoc crisis, and that, that has been continuing, um, and the huge level of trust. So in that environment, the time to develop consensus and spell out the finer points of a technical process is just not there, which is why you have a situation now where every step of the process is contested because a lot of the finer points have not been fully fleshed out. So for example, you have the agreements in Dusama Reb 3, which was the agreement in which the opposition and federal member states and the government agreed on how on, on, on who would be selecting membership to the federal election committee uh, but there was not a clarity on whether or not there could be civil servants there, members of the national security in, you know, uh, agency. Um, and so because of that, then you have to have these, these you know, con contestations that continue. Um, so I'll just leave it at there to sort of highlight why, why it's been challenging um, to try and um, do a technically sound process when you have political challenges. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on from that, um, and and to sort of touch on the, the question of, of, of a one person, one vote um, system. I mean, what do you think would need to happen between the current election cycle and the next one due in 2024, 25, if Somalia is to get to that system? And do you think that that um, amount of, of time is, is, is sufficient to get to, to get to a one person, one vote system? So just a, a, quick, a, a quick point yeah. on that. Sure, sure. I think, I, mean, I, I agree with, with Michael Keating in that uh, a one person, one vote, uh, you know, can potentially be um, a source of contestation and conflict if you haven't addressed the other political um, conflicts that are existing. Um, number one, as was mentioned earlier, federalism is not yet fully defined, right? The constitution, which is partly the means through which some of these issues can be addressed, has not been touched since 2012. That's eight years. So you've had two administrations who've not been able to actually move these critical transitional tasks forward, including the constitutional review, the completion of the federal system, the development of a multi-party electoral process, uh, uh, you know, fiscal federalism as part of the federal system. All of these have not, th there've been some work. I don't wanna, I don't wanna say nothing has happened. There've been partial agreements, but they've never actually been fully fleshed out, fully agreed to. And so if you're going to, to talk about getting into federal elections, um, you, you really, there really needs to be a return come day one after when this process gets moves forward to start to really look at, you know, tasking the new political leadership. And actually you have a unique moment because you will have the same leadership because they've had elections in all the federal member states, and now you're gonna have the elections at the, at the FGS, you're gonna have, barring any unforeseen issues, which can always happen in Somalia, you will have the same set of actors within these leadership positions. So beginning to task them, right, to, to come to agreement on, on these issues, um, but with input from the public. Uh, and, and, some of, and, and, and I think the other option is to start thinking about 
the potential to focus on local local level elections, you know, where there's more of an opportunity to develop tech, technical processes, um, agreement, as long as there's agreement on the rules of the game. Um, and really at the end of the day, that's where most Somalis actually meet their government is really at the, at the local level. But even then, you can't really go too far without starting to address the questions around who's able to participate in the electoral process, who's able to vote, who's able to represent their constituency. Mogadishu has up to 500,000 IDPs, you know, who've been there from some of them more than 20, 25 years. Are they able to vote in Mogadishu or do they have to go back to their quote unquote home area? Which kind of gets back to the point around going back to these critical transition tasks, these constitutional tasks to really start looking at these, at these issues of contestation um, before you start getting into how you design the next electoral process. Thank you. Thanks, Hodden. Um, I'm going to turn now to some of the questions that have been coming through um, from uh, some of the, the listeners. Um, I want to focus initially back on, on the elections um, to, that are happening, that are coming up soon. And we've got a few questions around this. One from Hussein Mersal, who wants to know, um, and he's a, he's a freelance consultant on diversity and inclusion. Um, and Dr. Mersal wants to know, what, what is the difference this time to convince Somalis that, 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 we're be, that they're better off than last elections? Um, and then uh, an, another question on the current elections um, from Aaron Stanley. Um, do, do we think that the elections this far have helped to establish the broader legitimacy of the central government? Uh, that's a, I suppose that's a historical question. And, um, you know, does a successful... Um, Elections strengthen the legitimacy of central government in relation to the regions. So um, it would be good if you could answer those questions. Um, I think um, I'll turn to uh, Omar first. I think maybe to talk about the, um, you know, what it what it means in terms of the the legitimacy of the government. So Omar, over to you. Sure. Um, you know, I think. The starting point here is one thing that Somalia has done really well, which, which I think was highlighted as well by, by the previous speaker, is that there has been a regular election process and transfer power at, at the highest level, um, which you know, we don't see in the region as much. Um, so there has at least been that con continuity there. And, and so I think that's a very positive thing and, and something to, to develop on. Those norms are there in terms of rotation of power. You know, typically we see contestation very much before the election uh, rather than, than afterwards. Um, so, but, but at the same time, you know, establishing legitimacy of the government goes well beyond elections. It, it goes to daily governing uh, in between those two different cycles, those two different periods. And so I think that's where, you know, um, where, you know, we've seen progress, but perhaps not as much as, as we were expecting. And especially if you're trying to talk about, you know, setting up this whole central model with the federal element to it that expands out into uh, the rest of Somalia and means something to the daily life of, of people out in those areas, that needs to be done in between those electoral cycles. Uh, and, and, uh, and progress, you know, I don't want to say no progress has been made there, but that, that's where the push needs to come. So regardless of what happens uh, every four years at that level, you know, we do have some established norms there, but much more needs to be done, I, I'd say, on that area to really tie into the legitimacy aspect. Thanks. Uh, Michael, did you Want to come in on that? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so let me, yeah, I just want to go back to a question that you asked at Hodan in terms of getting to one person, one vote, because I think it relates to this. And I, I do agree with her that, you know, this perennial problem of federal government, federal member state, power sharing, resources, revenues, and all the rest of it. Uh, and it is frustrating that the constitutional review uh, has not progressed. But, you know, I would make a broader point. Um, you know, one of the questions you put to me to think about this meeting was, you know, from my perspective, uh, how, how did we, we approach the elections? And I have to say that, that, that my approach was, you know, the job of the UN was to help the Somalis figure out what kind of state they wanted. It was up to the Somalis to decide. It's not up to the international community. It's not up to anybody else. But there has to be 
a conversation in which people are waving provisional constitutions at each other rather than Kalashnikovs, you know, and that needs to benefit from uh, other countries' experience, and it needs to look at what form federalism, having decided on federalism, and by the way, I'm in the camp that believes that the decision to go down the federal model was largely a Somali one. It was not imposed by others. It remains contested. But you know, what kind of federalism did they want? And I think elections are at the heart of that. They are the heart of the issue of what kind of state you know, do Somalis believe is going to be most legitimate and accountable to them. So I think, of course, you know, opportunities have been missed to put in place the substructure for one person, one vote. You know, you need things like an electoral role, you need an electoral law, you need investment, you need logistics, you need rules, you need all the stuff that many other countries have that Somalia does not really have. But, you know, in a way, as other speakers have said, there are more fundamental problems. The first is security not just Shabab, because there are other forms of insecurity, but also the issue of, of you know, what kind of national security architecture uh, does Somalia want? And, and, you know, what does an accountable police force and army look like? These are very big discussions about the nature of, of the state that take place in many other places. Uh, and, and I would also say that the other big issue is how do you move from a clan-based system to one that is geographically based. And I don't see that happening any other time soon. And I think I heard Hoden say, and if she did, I totally agree with her, that the place to start this shift is at the local level, at the federal level, because you, you know, the 4.5 iron grip of 4.5 is less strong within federal member states than it is at the national level. And maybe what you could do is start saying, well, let's have geographical representation in federal parliaments, in federal, in, in, uh, you know, in the member state parliaments as a stepping stone to getting to them at the national level. But this is going to take several years. And, you know, what would be ideal is if there is a politically agreed, there will never be total consensus, but a politically agreed roadmap in terms of the direction people want to go in. The last point I would, I would make, Alyssa, and forgive me for taking up so much time, but to the degree that, you know, elections are a political process with electoral features, they're not elections. And by the way, I spent a lot of time, you know, dealing with eager beaver internationals who came in with their rule book as to what elections would look like. And they would look at the Somali model and there was no correlation between the rule book on elections and the way the Somalis were doing it, you know, and how, how do you square that one? But anyway, you know, to the degree that the, these elections um, are a political process, I think the other point that's been made that I would like to emphasize, it is really important to extend participation in that political process. Get young people involved, get women involved, get minorities involved, even get, you know, the private sector involved at a local level. I mean, but not just leave it to clan elders and power brokers and you know the diaspora you have to broaden the political debate in a meaningful way so that there are other voices and if the broader that participation i think the more robust uh the roadmap is going to be and the likelihood of moving to one person one vote that will go up i think but again even that participation is difficult with the best will in the world in a country as poor as somalia ensuring that participation despite social media and sometimes because of it is quite complicated. Thanks Michael. Hodden, did you want to add anything? Um, <clears throat> and yeah I just yeah. sorry and, and also um, I, I, I suspect that this isn't possible but we've had one request from from a, 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 a a listener who isn't who isn't a Somali expert, um, if you could explain the 4.5 system, I mean, as briefly as very, very briefly. Sure. <laughs> sure. So the 4.5 system is a political power sharing formula that has divided up seats in the federal parliament um, and to some degree within some federal cabinets positions 
among the four main clans with 0.5 being uh, an amalgamation of all the quote unquote minority clans. Um, so for example, if you have 100 seats in parliament, you'd have, you'd have, um, you'd have the seats divided 4.5 uh, across all of, um, of those particular communities. And it was, it was, and I would argue that it was probably a necessity back then as a sort of a peace building formula to ensure that communities felt that they could be represented because in previously it was a pre winner take all um, um, uh, situation. So I think, so the 4.5 though was already always envisioned um, to be gradually phased out. Um, and it came in in 2004 as part of the Mbagathi agreement um, and, has, and has actually stayed. Uh, now we're, we're in 2020, precisely because it is so difficult to make that transition into a sort of either multi-party electoral process or one person, one vote. Um, and I would only add in terms of legitimacy and popular participation in elections, uh, you know, at some point, I think that like, like Michael said, the bar is pretty low in terms of people just want some stability. They want a sense that the key uh, uh, power brokers have, have reached consensus. But at the end of the day, if you continue to have these cycles of, um, of electoral processes that begin to um, continue to be focused around a small, a smaller group of people, um, uh, part of being part of the process. And even more importantly, if people don't actually see tan tangible changes in their lives uh, because of government, because why else do you participate in electoral processes is because you want to have somebody who will, who will fight for you, who will, who will make a, a better Somalia. And you only need to look to Somaliland. Um, when I was at USAID, we were part of supporting some of the electoral processes. And you could see in, in the last election in 2017, participation dropped about 40% uh, from about a little bit less than a million people who, who registered to vote and, and voted to 600,000. And when you talk to broadly people, there was a frustration that what's the point? Nothing has changed in the last you know, X number of years. So I think it just highlights the importance that at the end of the day, there has to be tangible changes in people's lives. Yeah, thanks, Adam. That's really important. Um, we've had quite a few questions um, coming in um, on on sort of the engagement of external external actors in 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 the elections. So I'd like to sort of try and address a few of those. Um, in particular, some questions around. Um, the, the Gulf state interests, um, but also Russia and China, and you know what, what their interests are in, in, the, in the elections. Um, and, and also a question specifically on, on the region, you know, sort of like particularly around political tensions between Kenya and Somalia, and you know how um, how might they play out in the elections? Are they going to have any impact on the elections? And then I mean, also looking forward beyond that, I mean, um, you know, we're sort of seeing um, some you know the the events that we're seeing in in, in Ethiopia are obviously going to have a likely they continue likely to have a destabilizing impact in 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 the region and also on on Somalia and just sort of. So be interested to know from, from you, you know, what, what are the um, uh, impacts of, of uh, external actors in, in Somalia in the elections coming up? Thanks. Um, I'll go to um, Michael first, if that's okay. You, you're on mute. Okay, well, I, I will try and be briefer than I was last time. I mean, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, the uh, Somalia has become a theater for geopolitical competition. Uh, it always arguably has been, you know, including in the, you know, 70s and 80s between uh, the then Soviets and the, uh, the Americans. More recently, you see competition, as I think many people know, between um, Gulf states and Turkey. Uh, China is interested in Somalia as part of its broader Africa approach. There's interest in the ports, in resources, you know, whether it's oil, gas, possibly even solar, wind, and other resources that could become more valuable uh, given the way the world is, is going. Um, but, you know, uh, and despite its, uh, and it is a strategically important location, of course, the Bab el Mandab, you know, the big fishing stocks of Somalia. So it's a place where 
many states have a strong interest in having a political leadership that is sympathetic uh, to their particular objectives and to their particular political uh, philosophies, um, whether they are um, you know, secular or Islamist or whatever. So there is an interest in making sure that um, you know, uh, the state uh, is run by people who are seen as sympathetic, if not allies uh, to, to these powers. Um, I think the fragmentation of the state and this, this ongoing tussle between the respective power of the federal government and the federal member states, and actually the lack of authority of the federal government over many federal member states, despite efforts to bring them to heal, as it were, creates a lot of space for international actors to find partners and clients, you know, um, who are sympathetic to them, even if the federal government isn't. So I do think there is an interest in, 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 in who wins. Uh, but I think, uh, like everybody else, I mean, my recollection of 2016, 2017, and by the way, again, I saw my job as trying to make sure that all members of the international community, whether it was Security Council members, whether it was countries sending Amazon troops, you know, the neighbors felt that they had a common interest in uh, supporting the Somalis to develop rules and regulations, which may be uniquely Somali and totally unreplicable anywhere in the world, but then getting the Somalis, once they had agreed to these rules and regulations around the elections, to stick to them. And, and you know, of course, money changes hands in order to try and influence certain politicians and, and to enable them, you know, to get votes and all the rest of it. But, you know, Somali politics is so surprising. I, I don't think you can, even for external actors, the, the electoral system is so extraordinary that there isn't some kind of, you know, um, obvious pathway to figuring out, you know, how you do this. I mean, take the election. You know, one of the things that Somalis are very proud of is that every four years they have a new president. And you know, there's a thing on Twitter that goes around showing the results of the last five elections in Djibouti and the faces of the winners of the last five presidential elections in Djibouti. And you then compare that with the winners of the last five presidential elections in Somalia. And it's a very telling um, you know, image. And the assumption is there is going to be a new president and no one quite knows how it's gonna work. So you can spend an awful lot of money trying to influence um, both parliamentary and presidential outcomes. Uh, and it can be a very poor investment because you may not get a return on your money. Uh, and frankly, ideological differences among Somalis, in my view, with the possible exception of Shabab and a couple of other groups, are less important than clan affiliation and you know, what they're prepared to say in terms of access to resources, control of ports, and very practical things like that. Thanks, Michael. Um, Omar, do you have anything to add on, on, on those dynamics? Yeah, so I think um, absolutely we have to be watching with regards to external actors and involvement in the elections. And the issue, the way I see it, is that Somalia, the problem is external actors come with these competitive divides. And, and that means they're trying to outdo each other and it leads to tit for tat actions within, within Somalia itself. And if you look at where the region and, and the wider region was in 2016 to 2020, I think there are differences there. So first of all, in 2016, the GCC crisis hadn't been out yet. Um, you know, of course, uh, UAE and Qatar uh, competed in, in general, but it's not at the level it is now. You look at the, the Horn of Africa as well. I mean, Ethiopia and Kenya's divide has only increased over, over what they see and then how they um, see the future of Somalia as well. And so I think there's some worrying um, dynamics that these competitive rivalries from outside actors that are foisted upon Somalia are not really being resolved, but rather are, are uh, aggravating. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a worrying uh, dynamic when it comes to the, the, the 2020 um, election. Now, what we've seen thus far is, is you know, I, I think the incident with regards to um, 
the Somali government kicking out the, the ambassador just over the past few days is kind of telling and a bit of an externalization of internal Somali issues and, and, and blaming um, external actors for that. And I mean, there, there's clear reasons for this. The, the Somali political opposition, you know, most of them have been based in Nairobi until just going back to Somalia recently. Um, of course, uh, Farmajo in the dispute with uh, Madobe in, in uh, Jubaland blames Kenya for supporting Madobe as well. And, and so we already see how these external um, dynamics and divides, I think, are really becoming intertwined into, into Somali politics. It's, it's a dangerous mix when, when that happens. And we don't have the ability to really compartmentalize the, these issues. Um, and so I think for, for 2020, we we're at an interesting point because the, the external rivalries are a little bit increased. But as, as uh, Mr. Keating also says, some actors invested quite a bit in 2016 and didn't really get the results that they want. And that might make them think twice this time around. Um, but but I think um, you know w with regards to this, it, it's something the international community should be watching closely because the, the further we go down this path of of of, of uh, adding these divisions within Somalia, it only complicates the process and 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 um, you know further gets us away from consensus internally within Somalia as well. Hodan, did you want to come in on this? Uh, no, I think Omar and Michael covered it quite well. Okay, thanks. I mean, I would, um, we've had quite a lot of questions come in, um, but I want to just touch a little bit on the security situation. We've had a couple of um, questions relating to um, uh, Al Shabab um, and you know the the targeting of, of um, electoral delegates in 2016, and you know, are we um, going to going to see similar threats coming forward this year? And also um, questions around. Um, Amisom and its role and, um, you know, what the impact of, of possible withdrawal of, 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 of troops and eventually the, the peacekeeping mission, you know, what, what they, how they feed into some of the uh, issues of stability in, in, in Somalia. So, um, Hodan, I don't know if you want to go, do you want to talk about, uh, do, you, do you want to go on Al-Shabaab and security? I yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a factor. It's going to be a factor. Uh, if people can remember, I, I can't remember if it was about a year and a half ago, Al-Shabaab had summoned elders uh, in each of the major regions um, and they summoned them by four, basically. It was, a, it was an invitation that, that they could not turn down. Um, and they were told specifically in no terms, can you participate in the next electoral, election, next electoral process and that you need to ask for forgiveness and pay a fine. Um, and within a few months, there were a several incidents of elders being assassinated who were not, who did not uh, go to Al-Shabaab. So yes, I mean, I think as you start to, um, as planning gets into effect in terms of how you start to secure the electoral sites, especially in the FMSs, um, there's going to be a question about capacity at the FMS level to provide adequate security. I think Amazon does not have the capacity to deploy into areas that they are not currently. Um, it, that will be a challenge, I'll just say that. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot of discussion around how they can, um, you know, how they can more robustly have uh, planning at the FMS level. Uh, and again, this is a source of contestation, of course, between the FMS and the FGS. The FGS has the SRA uh, and, and, F and certain FMSs do feel that they don't trust the SRA. Um, and so it just kind of overlaps the, the larger tensions between the, the center and the periphery. Um, Omar, do you, do you want to come in on, on that? Sure. I mean, yeah, what we saw last time and after the 2006-17 elections, unfortunately, was Al-Shabaab targeting electoral delegates, I mean, uh, upwards of, a, you know, every other day for, for quite some time, uh, not just in Mogadishu, but elsewhere uh, outside uh, in, in other areas of the country. So unfortunately, they, they've been quite good at that, and they've signaled that uh, something very similar, uh, you know, in terms of their contestation of the elections is, is happening uh, for 2020. 
you know, I think there's some talk about whether Al Shabaab might use the indirect process to influence the the elections, the outcomes as well. Um, we've done some research, which which we'll be putting out soon. That doesn't really point to that. You know, Al Shabaab has been quite consistent. That they are outside the process. They don't believe this process. That participation in this is is a positive activity, and you will be targeted for that. And I think they've been quite clear in their rounding up of of the elders, as, as Hodan mentioned uh, a year and a half ago, stressed that as, as well. Um, so, so I think really means we have to consider when it comes to security for elections, it's not just security on election day, in my view, it's, it's also election after, it's also security after that, you know, I mean, asking people to participate in this process, which makes them a target, and then to say after the day after the election, well, you know, that's the kind of um, the end of it is a bit disingenuous. Of course, you know, Somalia is, is a difficult context. You can't provide food to everyone all the time. Uh, obviously, that, that hasn't been the, the case. But there needs to be consideration for that security for this election planning should go after election days as, as well. And, and, you know, I think that's where we see, you know, the future of, of Amazon and the role of the mission. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about what that's going to be, what it's going to look like post-2021. You know, I'm, I'm of the view that I, I don't think the Somalia is going to be ready to take primary security force responsibility from Amazon by the end of 2021, um, especially when we've been distracted by processes uh, like these elections and, and sort of the continuing aftermath of that as well. Uh, so I think as the international community wants to support Somalia in this, and especially on the security side, we have to think through some of these things a, a bit clearly. Thanks, Omar. I mean, we've, we've only got a few minutes left and um, we've had lots of questions and I really apologize if we haven't had time to answer yours. There's one last question that I want to put to, to each of the um, each of the panelists and it comes from uh, Jose Barahona. Um, and th they say, apart from avoiding election related violence, what opportunities are, are there, if any, um, for these elections to bring an improvement um, in the situation in Somalia? So, um, Michael, we'll start with you, please. Thanks. Well, um, the first thing to say is that I'm disappointed by what Omar said, and it is a way of answering this question. Uh, I'm sure he's right that Shabab is not showing an interest in investing in these elections in any way, not even by, you know, through influencing the choice of uh, people in the Electoral College. You know, I mean, one of the things with extremist groups is, is whether you can find a nonviolent way to engage them in political processes. And if this election does not move the needle on that, and if people who are involved in the electoral process then become targets, that would be extremely uh, bad news. I mean, I think the way they could help move things forward, and I will be repeating what I've said before, is to deliver a result that is received as legitimate, that no matter how eccentric the rules around this election are, that they are respected, uh, you know, and that the things that the civil society uh, coalition recently called for make a lot of sense to me, you know, in terms of candidates and everybody involved, um, you know, behaving uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a responsible way. And that they are a sign, you know, that despite the many shortcomings, that they're nonviolent, that Somalia continues to move towards a, a you know, uh, a, a, a political, um, uh, what's the word, a, a political discussion uh, that will allow progress, you know, that the result will, will embolden whoever wins to move forward on constitutional reform. And also this very tricky issue of national security and, and strengthening security forces. I think it's so fascinating that there has been this rejection of the idea of the federal government providing security uh, in the places where it can, because they're just not trusted. And that has got to be a metric. I mean, we need an, a winner who feels that he, and it will be, he has the mandate to move forward on these things. Thanks, Michael. Hodan? Um, if I can get the question again, is is the question is what is there an opportunity for this election to to help move the needle yeah, forward well, on yeah what on what opportunity is there and how might it might it um, uh, improve the situation in in Somalia? 
Well, I think as, as Michael said, it's really what happens after the election that can improve or not improve the situation. I think that so long as the key actors, and I think they will at the end of the day, I'm not one of those who thinks that there will be electoral, let's say, violence that, that breaks out in Mogadishu because of a lack of agreement to the stakeholders. I think they will, in a very Somali style, come to a consensus to an agreement, you know, right, right before they go off the cliff. Um, but there will be a consensual agreement that that has a, the electoral process moving forward. And for better or for worse, you know, the ability to do that is, is a good sign, you know, it, it's a good sign that, that at the end of the day, these, are, these key political power brokers are able to come to consensus. But really, we need to be seeing what happens afterwards. Um, and whether we'll be back in having the same exact discussion in 2024 or not. <laughs> Uh, I hope not. Um, I'll give the last word to Omar. Thanks. Sure. I mean, I, I think I'd echo some of this. You know, there's there's the part about the process itself, and then there's the part after the process. So if we're looking at the process, what can we say uh, in terms of, of some improvements? You know, I think I'd, I'd um, uh, sort of emphasize the point I raised earlier about getting civil society involved in there. You know, there's uh, the, the stakeholders agreed to have them play a role. It's very unclear how that's going to play, but getting at least the ball rolling on that expands inclusivity and brings a, a bit of a check onto some other aspects of, of the process. And then, of course, preserving the norms that, that have been established, and that is how in the election every, every few years and, and um, when uh, the results dictate transfer power as well, and that's accepted by everyone after the fact. So I think preserving that, what we already have in the process and pushing for some small areas of improvement can help. Uh, but then again, it, it comes down to after the fact as well. And I think the, the key thing we should be looking at is, you know, for much of 2020, we've been distracted by electoral dynamics and this going back and forth. And it's really put a hold on a lot of other issues, such as the provisional constitution, such as um, figuring out how to manage this relationship between the federal and member states and, and the federal government, uh, such as on, on security provisions as well. And so those are going to come up quite strongly after. And so I think the benefit is we'll at least have a, a period of time before maybe the next regional election to, re to really focus on that. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, um, Omar. And uh, not the most positive notes to end on from you three, but I think there are some 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 hopes that we can sort of move forward and use the next couple of years to sort of to to redouble efforts in 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 Somalia. I want sorry. to. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go on. Holly. Yeah, sorry. I wanted to add something. I feel as the uh, as the only woman on this panel, I should have brought this up earlier. There has been considerable backsliding on the, the uh, opportunities for women to participate in this electoral process, whether it's part of the committees or even potentially the quota. Um, so I think that's important to flag that that the, there is an opportunity if these if, if the key stakeholders can can ensure that women still are able to uh, play um, their you know, have their fair share in terms of opportunities. Okay. I think I wanted to flag that. Thank you. Thanks, Hodon. That's a, a really important point to make, and and you know hopefully we won't see any further backsliding. Um, so uh, I think we have to leave it here for today. I just want to um, thank the panelists uh, for joining us. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, also, um, just to let uh, let you know that the um, the event has been recorded and it is available um, on our website and I think it will also be on our YouTube site as well. Um, so www.crisisgroup.org slash event uh, hyphen recordings if you want to watch it again. Um, and I uh, just want to thank you again for joining us and um, uh, have a safe have a safe day. Thanks. <laughs>